three week and today is the last day. Um, but I want to conclude, uh, conclude the message that I began a few weeks ago about who keeps a record. Who keeps a record? You know, I lived in China for 10 years. And while I was in China, my sister in America kept my, rec kept my finances for me. And when, and, and when I got back to America, do you know what I found out? I found out that my sister loved me very much, but she was very, very terrible with keeping my finances straight. And so I would find out, I would, I would get back there and I'd find out, here's a letter from the credit card company, and the credit card company would say, your bill is overdue. <laughs> Many times. I had enough money, but it was just late to be paid. So you know what? Somewhere in America, with credit, card com with credit companies, Jennifer Nolan has a record by her name that sometimes she does not pay her bills on time. <laughs> And that makes my heart hurt very much. When I came to China, I found out that America wasn't the only place that kept records. And those of us who've lived in China and our Chinese friends would say, yes, we know all about that. When I came to China, I found out that I had a record that in China, I would have a record that I would have a file. And wherever I went in China, that record would follow me. And it's called a Dang An. Right? Priscilla, do you have a Dang An? Dang An. Dang An. Do you have a Dang An in China? Yes. Everybody in China had a Dang An. And everything is recorded there. When you were born, your grades in school, were you a good student? Were you a bad student? Is your attitude good or bad? How about your work? Is your work good? And it follows you. Every, and some of you are looking at me like, oh! <gasps> every culture, every country, every society keeps records. Every society does. But what I want to talk about is what is most important. Because there's something more important than whether or not Jennifer Nolan pays her bills on time or whether or not she got an A in a class or a B in a class. The same thing is true of you. And there's something more important and we want to conclude this morning. Who keeps a record? Who keeps a record? And we've been talking about who keeps a record of our sins. And that's very strong, isn't it, when we say that? Who keeps a record of our sins? But we talked about this because we know that we keep records, we have memories, and we think about these things. There, you can use any word that you want to. You can say sins. You can say shortcomings. We could say failures. We could say mistakes or errors. But the question we've been looking at is, who keeps a record? The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, uh, this one is not in, the, not in our, our, Priscilla, this one is not on their sheet. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we read this, it reminds us that the record that is kept and the standard that is given is not according to what people think. You see, if I compare myself to some people, guess what? I'm better than some people. I know I am. I can look at some people and say, I know I'm better than that person. I don't do this and I don't do this and I don't do that. But maybe I compare myself to somebody else and I think, oh, but they're better than I am. But brothers and sisters, the comparison and the standard is not according to people. It's according to God. And God's Word says we've all fallen short. Here is God's standard. How can I ever reach that standard? How can I ever meet that standard? Sometimes I can. Sometimes I can do well. If I try really hard, if I do my best, but I can't always meet that standard. I can't always reach that level. But fortunately, God says to us, when we confess, 
We say, God, I've sinned. God, I've fallen short. He's faithful and just, and He forgives and He purifies. But we always keep in mind that it costs something. It's not easy. It's not easy. You know, sometimes when we say, I'm sorry, it's pretty hard to say, isn't it? Is it, is it hard to say, I'm sorry? Or is it just for me? I hate to say I'm sorry. I really do. I hate to say, I, it's, I have to work really hard. Say, God, help me. And then I have to go say I'm sorry. Because sometimes I think, well, they're wrong too. But it's up to me. I don't have to judge their heart. And I don't have to look at their heart. All I have to look at is mine. It's mine. And so I go and I say, I'm sorry. But have you noticed, for some people, sorry is very easy. A few people, right? Sorry. 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 And when we hear that, you know what we think? You're not sorry at all. You're just saying it. That sorry was very easy for you. But when we come to God, never, ever, ever let sorry be really easy. Never let it be, oh God, I'm sorry. God loves me so much, He doesn't really care. God always cares. And the cost of forgiveness is the price of the blood of Jesus, His only Son. And so we look at it and we understand what it costs. And we've talked about all of this. But when we look at keeping a record, who keeps a record of our sin? Let's get the next slide. Who keeps a record of our sins? First, ah, we keep a record, don't we? We keep a record. I keep a record of my own sins. I keep a record of <clears throat> your sins. Because we're people sometimes, don't we? We look, I remember what he did. I remember what she did. How do we handle this? Because if you and I live with the memory, I did this, I did this, I did this, our hearts and our minds will be so burdened, we will go through life without joy. We will never be able to enjoy the life and the love that God has for us when He gave us Jesus. God did not send Jesus so that you and I should go through our lives with the memory and the record of everything that we've done in the past that was not right. And so when we look at our past, which is not perfect, nobody has a perfect past, what do we have to look at? Next slide. Our past is always in the light of God's grace. It's always in the light of God's grace. It must be. If you look at your past and what you were without the light of God's grace shining, you will live with condemnation and guilt all the time. So you can't do that. We do as Paul says, by God's grace I am what I am. So it's in the light of God's grace. But we don't stop there. There has to be a change. And the next that we see is our minds have to be changed. Our minds have to be renewed by the Word and the Spirit. By the Word and the Spirit. And here's some of the scriptures that we have. The first one is in Romans 12 and then Ephesians 4. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Transformed doesn't just mean to change a little bit. It means completely changed. And when God comes into our hearts and into our lives, He starts a work in you. You're a new creature. You're a new creation. You're a new being. But some of us say, but I still think about that. I still battle that. Well, so do I. Because we are creatures and we're people of habits. We have the habits of the past. So it takes the work of God, the Holy Spirit, who is God, transforming our minds and changing our minds and changing the way we think. So in the light of God's grace and then as our minds are changed by God. He renews our thoughts and He renews our attitudes. So when you remember and when you keep a record of your past, look at it in the light of God's grace and let the Lord, Holy, Holy Spirit, transform your mind. Amen? Amen.
Amen. So, who keeps a record? Next slide. We keep a record, but there's somebody else. Our enemy keeps a record, and we have an enemy. And he hates us, and he wants to destroy us. And if he can't destroy us, he wants to take away every bit of joy and every bit of assurance of salvation that we can have because we have an enemy. And so when we battle, we know that we keep a record at times. So God has to help us with that. But our enemy keeps a record. Now, I have to work with God on this part. But what do I do about this? Can I stop the enemy by myself? No. So what do I have to do? What I have to do is look at God's Word. Here's the enemy when he attacks. It sounds like our own voice. And I have to look at God's Word. And I have to look at what God's Word says. So what does God's Word say about the enemy? The enemy's character and nature. Okay? The enemy's character and nature. The Bible says what? He is what? A deceiver. So he will trick you if he can. What else is he? He's an adversary. So he's not for you. He's against you. He won't pull your way. He'll pull against you. Someone opposed to you. Next, what is he? He's an accuser of the saints. How many of you are saints? Yes. You say, I fell short this week. I don't feel very holy. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what you did this week. The Bible says that you're for child, if you're a child of God, you are one of the saints. That's what God says. A church didn't say it somewhere and say, now I make you a saint. You know what I mean? Guess who makes you a saint? God makes you a saint through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you're a saint, but there's an accuser of the saints. What else do we see? He is the God of this world, the way this world thinks. And this world will never let you forget you blew it. You think you're good, but you did this. Yeah, you're good now, but I remember when. And that's the way that this world thinks. And so that's how the enemy comes. What else do we see? He's a tempter, so he will come to try to trip you up. And remember what we said? He never fights fair. At your lowest, when you haven't had enough sleep, when you're stressed out, when you're worried about this or about that, when you're thinking about this or that, that's when the tempter comes to try to make you fall and to think the way of, of the way that you used to be. What else do we see? He's Belial, that's one of his names, or worthless. So nothing good comes from him. What else? He's a thief. So he will rob from you if he can. And he is a what? A liar. He's a liar. And he will not tell you the truth. Or he'll tell you just enough truth to make you believe. And then he'll slip in the lie. So this is the enemy that we have against us. And the enemy also keeps a record. However, there is one who does not keep a record. And let's look at that. The next one, there's only one who keeps no record of our sins and failures. He's the only one who has a right to keep the record. The enemy has no right to keep a record, but he does. We don't really need to keep a record. We're not required to, but sometimes we do. There's only one who has the right. Who is it? God. He has the right to keep the record. He does. But he doesn't. But he doesn't. There's only one who does not. And I want us to think about this in our clo in, as we look at the rest of this. Um, I just want to keep this up for a while as we look at this and as we think about this. We're going to look at about 12 different scriptures. And some of you are going to say, why 12, Pastor Jennifer? How about just two? Wouldn't two be enough? But I want us to look at a lot of scriptures because you know what I found out as I began looking through this? When, God, when, when the Bible talks about how God deals with our sin, it is from Genesis to Revelation. 
It is sprinkled throughout the Word of God. God wants us to know that He doesn't keep a record. God wants us to know how He deals with sin. Now, let me ask you just a minute. How many of you sometimes think that God does this? If it's a small thing, a small sin, a small wrongdoing, God doesn't care. Number one, yeah? This is God's system for sin, for keeping records. If it's small, it doesn't really matter and God doesn't really care. If it's a middle sin, and we do it occasionally, then we should ask for forgiveness because God does look. And if it's a really bad sin, or we do it a lot, then even when we ask for forgiveness, God doesn't really forgive because we keep on doing it. And when we go back and we say, God, I'm sorry, God says, yeah, but you did it again. How many of you have ever thought about sin in that way? Thank you, Helen. Helen says, <laughs> <laughs> Helen's being honest. And if the rest of us were being honest, most of us would say the same thing. I've thought that way before. But God is not like the world. And God's li not like us. And God doesn't do it in that way. And I want us to look at what God says about His how he deals with our sin when we come to him. Okay? Let's look at the first one. From Hebrews 8.12. So if you're taking notes, now's a good time. Okay? We'll go through, a, we'll go through quite a few scriptures. Here's Hebrews 8.12. And what does he say? I will forgive their wickedness. This is the easy one, isn't it? This is the one that we all know. God forgives sin. But I want us to see something. That God is so rich and so colorful, He doesn't just say, I forgive. Do you know why God is so rich and colorful? Because our minds think all sorts of things. And so God says it one way, and then He says it another way. And then what does He say? I will what? Never again remember their sins. I will never again remember. That's Hebrews 8.12 and actually he's quoting the Old Testament. The writer to Hebrews is quoting that. He says, I'll never again remember. How many of you, you're just sitting there and suddenly there's a memory from your past. You have not thought of it in years and boom, it comes to your mind. Has that ever happened to you? And you think, oh, i would forgotten all about that. And it comes back again. Mmm. But God says, I don't think of it again. I don't, I will never remember it again. What do we see next? Isaiah 43, 25. He says, I, the next one. I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins. I like this one. For my own sake. And what? I'll never think of them again. So here we have, I'll never again remember. I'll never think of them. And I want us to see something else here this morning. What does God say? I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake. And I want us to understand that and take that into our hearts. Who can wash away and who can take care of sin and wrongdoing and failure in our lives? There's only one. God has to do it. Doing good works is not enough. Giving an offering is not enough. We give offerings and we do good works because God has blessed us. But that does not take care of sin in our lives. God has to take care of sin in our lives. And then what does he say? He says, for my own sake. Because sometimes we feel like I've got to work really hard and if I show God I'm good, then he will help me. If I show God I'm good, He'll forgive me. If I show God I'm trying really hard, then God will give me peace of heart and peace of mind. But that's not how it works. God says, I do it for my sake. I do it because I love you. I do it because you are my child. I do it because you are precious to me and you are a treasure to me. And I want to release you and free you from the tyranny of the enemy. And I want you to know the love and the joy and the hope that comes from being my child and living in my love and in my forgiveness. And so that's what he says in Isaiah 43, 25. And then in Romans 4, 6 through 8, what does he say? He quotes David and he says, Oh, what joy! How many of you know the joy of disobedience forgiven? Have you known that before? 
oh, and the burden is lifted from your heart and you say, oh God, thank you. Thank you so much. Disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are what? Put out of sight. And then what else? What joy who's, for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. Here's another way of looking at it. And some of you may say, well, does the Lord forgive or does He blot out? Or does He forget? Or does He not remember? He does all of those things. You pick your favorite. Pick the one you like. That's what God does. Which one speaks to your heart? Then take that one. Well, I like this one better. Well, take that one and say, God, thank you. For me this morning as I was driving my car into church, this is the one I was thanking the Lord for. And there are many, and I've, I've been going over this for weeks and weeks and weeks. But this one just spoke to my heart this morning, whose record the Lord has cleared. And for me, you know I'm a very dramatic, visual person. For me, I just had this, this image of, here's this record with all of the, the I've done this and I've done this, and, and I'm a pastor, but still I feel this way. And I'm a pastor, but sometimes I get get really impatient when I drive my car on the highway and I, I, I call people idiots. I, yes, Brother Stephen. I do. I think that's the worst I've ever called some. Have you called people idiots before too? Thank you, Brother Stephen. But you know what? We, we laugh about that. But you know what the Bible says? Idiot is the modern day translation of fool. It's, it's one of the modern interpretations. And the Bible says don't call anybody a fool or an idiot. And I remember the morning I was driving my car and the, I, I was listening to the Bible. Really. I, you know, your pastor should be honest with you. Really. And I was listening and that's the scripture I heard. And honestly, I've heard sermons before, but the Holy Spirit convicted me that morning. And in my heart I felt like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I've been calling people idiots all over Hong Kong. As, I am serious. As I drive, you idiot, you idiot, you idiot, as I'm driving down the road, as they pull in front of me or as they slow down too quickly or, or, or whatever. And the Lord convicted me. And He's helping me. He's helping me. But I'll tell you this. For my past record of that, guess what? I've already repented. So you know what? I have a clean record. My record has been cleared. And that's something that's maybe not such a big deal that nobody, ex nobody knows except God and I. The two of us together. We know that. You didn't know that till I told you. But you know what? It still mattered to God because it was on my record. But I repented. And you know what He did? He cleared it. He cleared it. And so my record's clean. My record's clean. And God doesn't think about it anymore. And God's transforming the way that I think. So that's the one that spoke to my heart. But that's not the only one. What else do we see? What's next? Acts 3.19. This was Peter when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost. To whom was he preaching? He was preaching to people who probably had said, Crucify Jesus. He was preaching to people that may have spit upon Jesus or thrown things upon Him. And yet to them, Peter says, repent and turn so that your sins may be what? Wiped away. Wiped away. Just like on a blackboard, it's wiped away. Or a whiteboard. And you don't see it anymore. But that's not, it. That's not all. What else is there? Micah 7.19. This is the one that Julie mentioned a few weeks ago. Remember when she was sitting back there and she said, He takes our sins and He throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. How many have heard that expression before? Panina has, Beth has, and I have. Do you know what I found out when I went back and looked? It's not in the Bible. <laughs> okay? So we have to be careful. But it does say, he, into the depths of the sea. When I was a child, my mother would talk about this verse, and I understood this verse when I was a child. So when she would say, the sea of forgetfulness, I could understand that. Because I could imagine throwing into the sea of forgetfulness and the sea is deep and God didn't think about it anymore. And that always gave me peace as a child. Did it give you peace, Beth? Sure, it did. And it was something that we could understand. I think this is why God gives us so many different ways. Into the sea, wiped away, cleared, blotted out. Never think of them again. Take your pick. All of them say the same thing. God does not 
keep a record of your sins. And then this one, the next one, Psalm 103. As far removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Now I am not a geologist or anything else, but east and west never, ever, ever will meet. They'll never come together. East and west, and that's how far God has taken our sins away. He keeps no record. And then the next one, Colossians 2.14. I like this one also. What does it say? He canceled the record of the charges. I love that picture. Look at what he did. He took it away. How did he take it away? Imagine your record. What did he do with it? Here's another picture for us. He took it to the cross and he nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. And the next one, why? From 1 Corinthians, the chapter on love, which describes God, which describes what God is doing in you and in me. It keeps no record of being wronged. He's the only one who could, but he doesn't. He's the only one who could, but he doesn't. I want to remind you of a famous chapter in the Bible. In that chapter, and I wrote it down so I could remember it. I didn't get everything. In that chapter in the Bible, there's the history of a liar, a man who drank so much he passed out, a man who cheated his own family, a woman who mistreated her helper, her slave, a murderer, a prostitute, a man who loved visiting prostitutes, Samson, and an, Samson did. You read his history. That's what he loved to do. And an adulterer. Where is this chapter of terrible, terrible people? Where is it? Where is it? Hebrews chapter 11. The great chapter of the heroes of faith. Everybody has a record. Everybody has fallen short. Everybody has not measured up. And if we kept a record, and if God kept a record, next slide, Heidi. If God kept a record, what does David say? Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? And the truth is, no one could. No one could. But the other truth is, he doesn't keep a record. He doesn't keep a record. And so we look at Hebrews 4.16. And what does it say? So let us come boldly to the throne of our God, and there we will receive His mercy and find grace to help us when we need it most. But when we've sinned, and when we've fallen short, that's when we don't want to come boldly, right? That's when we're afraid to come. That's when we feel like, oh, I can't come boldly because I've blown it. I've messed up. Remember in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned? What were the two things that they did? What were the two things that happened? Number one, instead of coming to God, what did they do? They hid. They ran in the other direction and they hid. What was the second thing they did when God asked them about what they had done? What did they, what did they say? <laughs> to everybody else. This word boldly means literally to speak freely. It means literally to say whatever is on your heart. And so God says when we fall short and when we need Him, don't run, come. Don't guard what you say, but speak openly. I want to show you a picture that will help you with this, because here's this, the throne of our gracious God. And I want to show you a picture 
I'm not talking politics, okay? Does every, everybody knows, you know, I almost never talk about, poli about my politics, at least in the, pul in the pulpit. But I want to show you a picture from the 1960s of one of my country's most famous presidents in modern times, okay? Let's, I, want, I just want to show it to you. Have any of you ever seen this picture before? Some of you have. You've seen, okay, thank you. Jill has seen it. You know, we're, we're, we're in another generation. If you were from the U.S., probably you've seen this before. It's an iconic picture. It's very, very well known in the U.S. And it's a picture of John F. Kennedy, JFK, who in modern times, many Americans, he had a terrible personal life, but was a good president, uh, politically or whatever. Um, and this is a picture of John F. Kennedy. He's in the Oval Office in the White House, the seat of power. And at that time, many would have considered this is the most powerful man in the earth at that time. Now, I'm not talking politics. Please understand. That. Please don't say, but in my country, I'm, I'm not talking politics. I just want us to understand something. But I want us to see this picture. And it's a picture that people love. And it helps us to understand Hebrews 4.16. Because Hebrews 4.16 says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace and receive help. Now look at this picture. It's the Oval Office. It's the desk of the president, the leader of the free world. This was in the early, early 60s. And what do we see here? Here's this little boy, this little child, crawling around his feet in the Oval Office. How can he do that? Isn't he afraid? Isn't he awestruck? Shouldn't he be careful? Shouldn't he be cautious about coming into the Oval Office? After all, that's the President of the United States. Why isn't he afraid? Why can he just come boldly? Because that little boy is John F. Kennedy Jr. And he's the son of the pres he was the son of the President. John John, he was called at that time. And to me, this picture, it's imperfect, but it's such a good example to help us understand how and why we can come to God, our Father, because He is our Father. And we come not because of the good that we have done. We, not, we come not because of our great record, because I can tell you something, that little boy, John John, he was really, really naughty. He did all sorts of bad things in the White House. He broke things. He colored on the walls. He did this and he did that. But he wasn't afraid to come into his father's presence. He could come boldly. And so, Hebrews, the next part of Hebrews says... We can boldly enter. Why? Because of Jesus. Let us go into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Hold on tightly. Now there's another, there's a whole context for this, but I want us to understand this. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. Do you know all those things that we just read about God? I remember your sins no more, I don't forget, I do this, I do that, I do whatever. Go back to slide 15, Heidi, slide 15. Look at this one more time, the promises of God. First, what does it do? He forgives, He never again remembers, blots out, never thinks, puts them out of sight, clears, wipes away. Next, treads our sins underfoot, hurls them into the depths of the sea, removes as far from the east as from the west, cancels the record, and he keeps no record. You can just leave that up just a minute. Those are all taken from the promises of God that we just read. These are the promises of God. So we may come to him if you want to look at these later, you say, well, I want to see that. I'll put my notes up here. You can make more copies. Don't worry about that. We'll put it up um, on, the, on the Facebook page. God keeps no record. So you can come. You can live in confidence. But I want to be honest with you this morning as we close. 
I wasn't completely honest with you. God does keep for His children one record, doesn't He? Slide 18. Uh, God keeps only one record for you if you are His child. You say, what? I thought you told me He doesn't keep a record. He keeps one. And we know what it is, don't we? What's the record? The last slide. He keeps a record of your name in the book of life. In the book of life. Vicki, your name is in the book of life. Iris, your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Alvin, your name is in the Book of Life. My name is in the Book of Life. Chris, your name is in the Book of Life. Really? Really. Is it a book with pages? I don't know. It's in heaven. Is it a real book? I don't know. It's God's book. Does he need a book to keep a record? I don't think so. He's God. But he speaks to us so that we can understand it. Beloved, beloved, beloved. That's the only record he has of you. It's the only record. Your name is in his book. And it is the book of life, not of sins, not of shortcomings, but a book of life. Therefore, come boldly. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to say, well, I hope I've done enough so that God is pleased with me. Come boldly. Come boldly. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah.